we will now look at our variable consideration component. Now, before you get confused with this very busy page, the flow of our discussion will be to first discuss, is this a variable consideration? Then we will look at our refund liabilities and then we will look at our certain contracts. The contract costs here at your left bottom, we will touch on at the end of our recording as well as our presentation and disclosure. Now the question, is the consideration variable? If your answer is yes, we will have to estimate the amount that we will use for our revenue. We can either use the expected value or the most likely amount. Now let's have a look at a small example and I'm going to include this on our right hand side. If we talk about our expected value, if we have an example where we have sold goods to a customer, there is a possibility that we will receive 10% of 2 million or we have a possibility of 20% of total value of 2.2 million or a 30% to the value of 2.5 million. Now, if we use our expected value, the standard indicates to us that the expected value is the sum of our probability weighted amounts in a range of possible consideration amounts. Therefore, if we sum our probability of 10%, 20% and 30% times the sales amounts, we will have an amount of 139000 that we may recognize as our consideration. The next method that we can use to measure is our most likely amount. Now, this is a difficult one. If, for example, our profit exceeds 1 million, we have indicated to all of our regular customers that if our entity's profit exceeds the 1 million, that they will receive a 5% discount. Now, the question, how do we know if our profit is going to exceed the 1 million? How do we estimate this transaction? This can either be a yes or a no scenario. And this is where it is extremely important that you will have to use your professional judgment, especially when it comes to theory questions. Now, do we use our most likely amount or our expected value? Whichever is most appropriate. Therefore, when there is a theory question, it is extremely important that you please read the information provided. Our next question that we need to ask is, we need to determine our portion for which it is highly probable that a significant reversal will not occur. Now, if we talk about the word probable, what does this mean? More likely than not. Therefore, this is one higher than probable. Now, I'm going to explain this by means of the following. Our first step is we will have to estimate our transaction price. Then we need to determine if there is a possibility that we will reverse a portion of this revenue. That portion that we will reverse, you need to take out of your estimate. And the remaining amount will be your transaction price. We can now move on to our refund liabilities principle. Now, this is the amount that the entity expect to refund our customer. And we need to measure this at the amount that the entity does not expect to be entitled to. Now, I want to explain this by means of two basic examples. 
Example A. We have a total value of sales of 100,000 and the entity expect to refund 20% of this sales. Now, what will our journal entry be? We will have to debit our bank if this is cash sales and if this is account sales, our receivables. Credit our revenue in our profit and loss to the value of 80,000. And what do we credit? We will have to credit a refund liability account to the value of 20,000. Now, let's just quickly talk about this refund liability account. Remember that this is a liability we expect to refund our client. Now, when we look at our second example, example B, we have a total value of sales to a customer of 100,000. Now, we indicate to our customer, if you pay within 30 days, you will receive a 20% discount on your sales. Now, what will our journal entry B. We will debit our trade receivables with 100,000. We will credit our revenue with how much? The 100,000 or 80,000. How do we know that our client is going to pay us within 30 days? Therefore, this will be 100,000. Now we need to recognize the possibility of our allowance for discount. Now, again, guys, professional judgment. If it is highly probable that our client will pay within 30 days, if we look at history and so forth, our journal entry will then be to debit our revenue and to credit our allowance for discount account with the 20,000. Now, this allowance for discount account it is important that you know that this is a negative asset. This will be netted off against our receivables and our statement of financial position. Therefore, you will not see this line item in our statement of financial position. And then at the end of each reporting year end, you need to update your refund liability account. We may now move on to our certain contracts section. Now, the standard indicates to us that there is contracts where control will be transferred to our customer and our entity provides to our customer the right to return the asset. Now guys, this is an extremely important section. Now, this right to return the asset. RFRS 15 distinguish into two different scenarios. The first will be where the return of our goods are not defective. Therefore, a customer will return the goods, but those goods can still be sold and they will return the goods for either a full or partial refund to credit the account or to exchange the product with another product. Now, important. If our customer exchange the exact same product and only size change. For example, if this is a t-shirt, but this is still the same product, this will not fall within RFRS 15. Now our entity has to recognize revenue, a refund liability, our cost of sales and inventory, and then the right of return asset account. Now, if you think about the journal entries, the sales transaction, the entity will debit trade receivables or bank, credit revenue, and credit the refund liability. And we need to take into account the cost of sales portion, therefore debit our cost of sales, credit our inventory, and we need to recognize the right of return of our asset. Remember that the refund liability and the right of return asset should be updated at the end of each reporting period. Our next scenario is that if the return of goods are defective, 
This will normally be our warranties. There's two questions that we need to consider. The first question, does the customer have an option to purchase the warranty separately? You will have to read the information in your question. If the answer is yes, this will be a performance obligation in terms of our RFRS 15 rules. Now let's recap. Step one, there has to be a contract. Step two, we have to identify our performance obligation. Step three, we need to determine our transaction price. Step four, we need to allocate the transaction price to our performance obligation. And step five, we may recognize our revenue. Therefore, guys, exactly the same process that you need to follow. If the answer is no, there is no option to purchase a warranty separately, we need to ask the next question. Does the promise warranty or part of the promise warranty provide customer with a service in addition to the assurance? We call this normally our assurance warranty. If our answer is yes, it's a performance obligation. If no, we will have to account for the transaction under IS37 and we will look at IS37 and our following weeks during the year.